Now today I want to take a few steps back and revisit Planck's constant and the nature of light. This is a battle that's been ongoing for many years in my life. I began debating this, uh, I can't even say how many years ago. Uh, at first it was in, in, um, in a physics forum, and then it was a, uh, a physics email group where I was arguing back and forth, um, and, uh, and on and on. And so I think it is uh, you know, prudent of me to come back and revisit this from time to time to emphasize and re-emphasize the points that I'm trying to make. And I know what the problem is, at least I think I know what the problem is, and most of the problem is in the language, it's in communication, it's in the way uh, we say certain things. And so part of the problem is, is this. Okay, so this is my um, analytics from my YouTube channel. And uh, apparently in my YouTube channel, uh, the demographics of my channel is 100% male. Okay, that, that's not to say that there aren't some, some women on my channel. I know that there are. Uh, there could be up to maybe 20, 22. I have around 4,200 subscribers. So 22 of them could actually be uh, female. And if they round this up, it's still gonna say 100%. And so, um, so this is what I'm battling here. I am not a guy, obviously. I am fractal woman and I have, women have different perspective on things, okay? Women are not wired the same as men, and I am definitely not wired the same as most people that I know, okay? So, so men are a little on the square side, okay? Men are square, women are circular, okay? Men are linear thinkers, men are linear thinkers, and women are circular thinkers. At least in, you know, I'm almost 60 years old. I have a lot of experience with men and women, with people, and uh, this is the conclusion I've come to based on all of my experiments in relationships with people. So in terms of um, slaying the dragon of theoretical physics, um, I have been focusing mostly on this equation here. And this is what I've been arguing, okay? I've been arguing about the interpretation of this equation for years and years. And uh, from the male-dominated physics community, which obviously it is a very ma male-dominated field, obviously uh, I can see that right here in my demographics. And, um, and so the main argument is focused around the action constant. Okay, it's the action constant. And so whenever I have an argument with a guy about playing, about this equation, uh, he says action constant. So, so men are very fixated on their action constant. Okay, so, and I do mean that in, to be a little bit funny here. Uh, men really like their action constant, if you know what I'm saying. And, but women, women are very cyclic. Women have cycles, women are cyclic, we understand what the word period means. In fact, uh, men are actually a little bit scared of that word. I actually have a funny story to tell you about that. One time I went to visit the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics uh, when they were opening their the new wing called the Stephen Hawking Wing. And they had a little tour and I went on a tour through the, the new wing and they had this, this beautiful glass um, stairwell, this beautiful glass um, hallway uh, where physicists were like writing on the windows, which I thought was really cool. And they had ask a physicist. And so I uh, asked, you know, talked to a couple of them, but I, I in particular was talking to this one very young physicist, maybe 19, 20 years old at the most, a, a, a very nice young man. And I, you know, basically told him, uh, I explained to him uh, how I wanted to put the uh, a cycle term into the unit analysis. So I wanted Planck's constant to, um, so it was the beginning of my modified unit analysis. So I wanted to add a cycle term to the unit analysis. 
and then reinterpret Planck's constant, uh, Planck's energy equation using um, a modified unit analysis. So basically I was saying I want to put the, t uh, the word cycle into the equation. So instead of um, the units of Hertz being one over S, I wanted the unit to be cycle. I wanted to put the word cycle into the unit analysis. And so he, um, at the end of our conversation, he kind of had a funny look on his face and he said, it makes me really uncomfortable putting the word cycle back into the equation or something like that. He it made him very un uncomfortable and he kind of backed away a little bit and I knew the conversation was over. And so, um, so that is uh, where the problem lies, I think, is uh, this term cycle, this term period, um, the, you know, is, makes men uncomfortable. And so that's why they, you know, and, and they're very linear thinkers. So once they have an action constant, they don't want to give up on their action constant. They understand this equation in terms of, uh, sorry, they want understand this equation in terms of action and they don't want to interpret it any other way. So interestingly, interestingly, um, back when I first started investigating um, Planck's energy e equation, I ran across uh, another woman, Juliana H. J. Brooks. Okay, Juliana Brooks, and she's written a bunch of papers on this. And um, so I'm just going to read a little bit, bit of this for you. So in this paper, uh, there's a, a re-examination of the work of um, Max Planck has revealed hidden variables in the famous quantum work consistent with Einstein's famous sentiment that quantum mechanics is incomplete due to the existence of hidden variables. Now, this term hidden variables actually, uh, when she uses the term hidden variable here, she's not talking about Bell's theorem, okay? This has nothing to do with Bell's theorem. This is nothing to do with, there aren't hidden variables in particles. There aren't some missing variables in the system. Uh, this is, you know, she's talking about a hidden variable in the very simple equation that, uh, that we see here, okay? She's saying that there's something missing from this equation. So uh, please don't invoke Bell's theorem when, when she uses the term hidden variables because that's not what she's talking about here. Okay, so let's uh, get into the second paragraph here. Uh, Planck's quantum formula, E equals H nu, and this, this little v here is actually a frequency term. Okay, so energy equals Planck's constant times frequency is missing the variable for measure time. Okay, it's missing, missing the variable for measure time. Planck had included the missing time variable in his earlier work, which she studied quite extensively, um, but omitted it in his famous work that sparked the quantum revolution. So, okay, so restoration of the measure time to Planck's quantum formula produces a more complete uh, E equals Planck's constant times frequency uh, and some uh, time interval, okay? So, um, the num numerical value of Planck that Planck calculated for his action constant, okay, takes on new meaning as energy constant for light, the quantum, which I call the quantum of energy. So she's the first person that I found that is saying that, you know, the action constant uh, should in reality be an energy constant, okay? It should be an energy constant. And, um, and so this, uh, I really think it's, it's a male-female thing. She has no trouble seeing it this way. Okay, this is just a reinterpretation of this equation. This is not a rewrite. It's not, um, you know, it's not something, you know, it's, it doesn't contradict anything from, you know, the, the equation still works, the formula still works, and you get the right number out. It's the interpretation of this equation that um, she sees differently and that I see differently than 99.9999% of the guys out there. And so, uh, so here, so I just write it a little bit differently than her. I put the T 
in between the H and the F, but that's neither here nor there. Um, that is just a way that I like to group it because this here, this term here is, uh, has the units of, of action, okay? Uh, but it with the, um, with the time variable exposed. But there is something else also missing from this equation. So not only was the um, a time variable um, excluded from the actual writing of this equation, um, but a little a delta term here was also omitted. And actually these two go hand in hand. These two go hand in hand. Um, this is actually the correct way to write this equation with or without the T. You need to have the delta here because this equation is um, change in energy. It's change in energy. It's not just energy. It's not just, uh, it's actually change in kinetic energy. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but this is actually without the T, this is how it is written. Okay, let me do it without the T. Uh, without the T, this is how it is written in MRI physics. So if you go to an MRI physics class and you sit in on the first lecture, which I did, um, it, this is the first equation that they throw up on the board or on the slide, and they have a delta there. So this is the correct way to write this equation, and this is the correct way to interpret um, this equation is a change in energy. It's not just energy. In fact, most energy is change in energy. Any, any, any energy that's useful is uh, change in energy. But that is how this equation should be written, and this is how it should be interpreted. And so that puts this equation on different footing as this famous equation equals mc squared. Okay, equals mc squared is a, um, it's a conversion of potential energy. It's conversion from mass to energy. Okay, this is not a change in energy. There, there should not and, and, you know, will not be a delta symbol here. That is what this equation is a change in kinetic energy and you have to put a delta symbol there. And this, this is a uh, potential energy. It is atemporal, it's got nothing to do with time, and therefore you do not have to write a delta symbol in front of it. And so that is the difference between this equation and this equation. This is a kinetic equation, and this is a potential equation, and there's a little hidden T in there. You could write the T or don't write the T, but there is a little, um, a, should be a little time variable in here to be complete, to be complete. But in my mind, if you put a delta symbol here, you don't have to write the T in here because it is inherent in the idea that this is a change. And time is an emergent property of change. Change and time are one and the same thing. So in terms of modified unit analysis, all I did was add a domain to the unit section. I call it the domain of oscillation. And I use this delta symbol to, to uh, represent one cycle or one unit of oscillation, which I call the cycle. And so uh, what this does is it changes a little bit of how things are represented in, uh, in the unit section of an equation. Okay, so delta per second is cycles per second. Okay, so these this is the unit of frequency in modified unit analysis. Seconds per cycle, okay, seconds per cycle uh, is the unit of the period. Okay, I know you guys will feel a little uncomfortable saying that word period. Come on, let's give it a go here period, okay? These are the units of the period. And as I said before, women are very, very uh, aware of um, what a period is, what a period means. We, we know it intimately. And, uh, and so I personally, as fractal woman, would prefer to see the units of the period with the cycle term written. Okay, so the units of the period are not S in modified unit analysis. Okay, the units of the period is uh, seconds per cycle. Um, so then we, I'm going to go to this one here. These are the units of wavelength, and the units of wa wavelength are meters per cycle. Okay, so that's different from mainstream. In mainstream, the units 
of the wavelength are just meters, uh, but I think it's important to write the cycle term in unit analysis to not confuse this meter with any, with just, you know, a meter, you know, 20 meters down the road, uh, some arbitrary meter. This is actually um, the wavelength is meters per cycle. And the inverse of that is the wave number, which is cycles per meter. This one is not as common. Um, this is often, um, so here, here's what I'm going to do. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write, um, instead of writing the delta, I'm going to write the 1. Uh, this is how it's normally done. So my main objection to putting the numerical value of 1 into the unit section is that the numerical value of 1, sh or any numerical value, should not be uh, found in the unit section not even the numerical value of 1, because you might be tempted to use it as the numerical value of 1, which, which is done in practice and is a mistake. It is a mistake. Uh, so uh, in mainstream, this is how they write the units of, um, of frequency, uh, and I think this is a mistake. And the, in the units of, um, the, units of uh, the period, okay, could have been written seconds per cycle, seconds per one, uh, but it's not, okay? So these three aren't, if, if they had written one over S, S, S over one, one over M, now it, for the wave number, they do write one over M, okay? That's how they represent the wave number, okay? But this is not the numerical value of one. The numerical values have no place in unit analysis, and especially if you try to use it as the numerical value of one by taking, say, you know, joules times one equals joules. You can't do that, okay? You can't use this as the identity of the real numbers value of one inside the unit section. This is supposed to be just a symbol, a variable name, name a placeholder, okay, for a numerical value. And so by putting a numerical value into the unit section, I think it confuses people and makes them think that they can use it as the numerical value of one, and they can't. They shouldn't, and it's a mistake, it's a bug, it's wrong, okay? It's mathematically um, not the right thing to do. And so that is why I replace the numerical value of one with a symbol so that you won't make that mistake. You're not going to be tended to make that mistake. And it, it makes things look nice and neat and tidy. Okay, the units of frequency, the units of period, the units of wave number, and the units of wave length. Okay, so I just like the way this looks better. It's more complete. Okay, this is complete. There's nothing missing from, uh, from these units. So to all the guys out there, to the boys out there, to the men out there, um, I just want you to give this some thought. Don't jump on it quickly. Don't invoke the action constant. Okay, what I'm going to say, what I'm about to say, I want you to just give it some thought. Okay, give it just a little bit of thought. Uh, because what I'm saying isn't wrong. It's just different. It's different than the way you say it, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. So here's, here's a question I have for you guys, okay? Here's a question I have. Uh, this is something that's, you know, bothered me over the years, but, you know, as time goes on, it just it makes me wonder why, okay? So in quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, here are two of the main equations that are cited, okay? This is the one we've been talking about, Planck's energy equation and de Broglie's uh, relation. Okay, so this is uh, momentum is equal to Planck's constant divided by um, lambda, which is wavelength. Okay, so my question is, why in quantum mechanics are the equations written in terms of energy and momentum when in the macro world, in, at the human scale, all of the important equations, the equations that are useful, that we use in practice, are written in terms of force. Okay, all, all of the important equations, the gravitational equation, Coulomb's law, Newton's law, and F equals QV cross B, which is uh, uh, related to magnetism, uh, these are all force equations. 
Um, and there's also power. There's also the power equations. Power equations are very useful, and that's what we're going to talk about next, okay? Because, um, so this is power equals voltage times current. Okay, so this is a very useful equation. So all of the really useful equations, uh, and this equation is not written in terms of energy. None of these equations are written in terms of momentum or energy. So here is the question that I have. Planck's energy equation was derived from the black body experiments that were done, you know, 100 years ago or more. Okay, the black body experiments were, was what helped Max Planck and others derive Planck's energy equation. But all of these equations are reported in terms of intensity. Okay, they're reported in terms of intensity. Okay, here's another one, radiation intensity versus wavelength. Okay, so, so what is intensity? What, is in, what are the units of intensity? So the SI unit for intensity is watts per meter squared. Okay, watts per meter squared. So um, why is it that all of the black body experiments were reported in terms of power, in terms of power? Okay, here's another one. This is from hi the Hyperphysics channel, which I love, or uh, website that I love because, you know, they're, they're very consistent and really nice and simple. So this is f the black body equation um, for the cosmic microwave background radiation, okay, which, so the cosmic microwave background radiation um, fits the black body curve perfectly, okay, and it is reported in watts per meter squared, okay, it's reported in terms of power. So here is the six, six million, maybe 60 million or 20 billion dollar question why was Planck's energy equation not written in terms of power? Okay, why wasn't it written in terms of power? So let's take a few steps back and just talk about what power is. Okay, in its most general form, power is work over time. Power is work that is done over some time interval. Power also has the units of joule per second. Okay, so now we need to talk about what is work. Okay, work is change in kinetic energy. Like I said before, work is change, delta means change, in kinetic energy. And so um, this is how you would write, in general, would write this equation. This change in kinetic energy over some time interval. Now, ultimately, we want to do work. Ultimately, the whole purpose of everything, <laughs> life, the universe, and everything is to do work, okay? To, um, to initiate some change in order to move something, to change something, to break something, to fix something, to build something. Okay, so ultimately, uh, work needs to be done and um, and it needs to be done over some time interval. So here is Planck's energy equation written in terms of change in kinetic energy. And here it is with the power equation. So ultimately what I want to do is I want to convert this equation to a power equation. Okay, I want this to be a power equation. So how would we go about doing that? Okay, and the reason I want to do this, this is because, again, all the black body experiments were reported in terms of watts per meter squared, power per meter squared. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the little t back in this equation as, uh, Jul as uh, Juliana Brooks uh, suggested in her paper. Okay, and as I have done in my Planck's constant and the nature of light um, paper. Okay, that's the first step is to put the little t in there because there's a t in here, there's a t in this power equation, and so I'm just going to put this back into the equation. And then I'm going to divide both sides by t. I'm going to divide both sides by t. So this one goes away, and now this is uh, delta e 
okay, change in energy over unit time, which we know is power. And now I've written this equation, I've written this equation in terms of power. Okay, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. This equation, in my humble opinion, was meant to be a power equation. So let's just look at these two equations and we're gonna look at this in terms of unit analysis uh, using the standard method for unit analysis. Okay, and then we'll do the modified unit analysis. But even just using the standard unit analysis, you can see how this can easily be done. So here on the right, we have Planck's energy equation, which uh, the output of that, that equation has to be um, joules, okay? And um, so, it, which expands to, which expands to, so in, in this equation, Planck's constant has the units of action, okay? J, joule times S is the units of action, times uh, the units of hertz, okay? And then what I do here, if, if I divide both sides by S in this case, so this ends up being joule per, per second, and this S goes away. So now we have the units. Uh, if I had written this equation um, and used standard units, this is how the units would look. And so you can see how easily this could have been written as a power equation, even back in the day without modified unit analysis. But with modified unit analysis, it makes things a little nicer, for at least um, I think it's nicer. Because basically here we have um, this equation, uh, change in energy is equal to Planck's constant times sometimes variable times frequency, and you divide both sides by t, and you end up with this equation. Um, and so here, this is interesting here, um, so now in this equation, Planck's constant has the units of joule. This time variable has the units of seconds per cycle. Okay, these are the units of the time period. Okay, that, that word that makes you guys really uncomfortable. Okay, these, this has the units of the time period, and this is the units of frequency and modified unit analysis. And so in the power equation, in the power equation, okay, what I do is I divide both sides by S, and then I, I group the, the, uh, the joule um, unit with the cycle term. Okay, so uh, it, with the power equation, we have the units of Planck's constant is joule per cycle. It's the quantum of energy, it's the energy of one cycle times the frequency term. And so, you know, this looks really nice to me. Uh, I just, you know, this uh, uh, makes more sense to me. This makes more sense to me that um, this equation should have writ been written in terms of power and not in terms of energy because, you know, all of the macro equations that we use in physics at, for the large scale, human scale, macro scale are written in terms of force and power. So here's what's really interesting, at least it's interesting to me, is how similar the units work out when I derive Planck's energy equation as a power equation, uh, how similar the units are to the famous power equation that we use in electricity. Okay, power equals voltage times current. The units of voltage are joules per coulomb, and the units of current are coulomb per second. So you can see when I flip back and forth between um, these two equations that if you replace the delta symbol with the Coulomb symbol, uh, you get exactly the same equation. And so um, I find this really interesting. There's a nice uh, sort of analogy and maybe even a, some kind of a symmetry between, um, the between this power equation and this power equation. So I'm going to take this a little bit further and use a bit of reverse psychology and, and um, get you to imagine what would happen if I did the following. Okay, so imagine if I applied the same logic to the 
Planck energy equation, imagine if I applied that same logic to the power equation in the uh, field of electronics. Okay, so um, in quantum mechanics, we say that energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency, and Planck's constant has the units of action constant. Okay, action constant divided by one. Action constant. I want to put the one there because uh, it looks more balanced to me if I can uh, cancel these two ones, okay, and cancel these two, and that the the units have to end up as energy. So I think it's important that I put that one there. Uh, you'll see what I mean in a minute. And then the units of frequency, of course, are hertz. And so in the standard notation, um, this is what quantum mechanics does. So I want you to imagine, what if I did this? What if I did this? What if instead of writing power equals voltage times current, uh, instead I wrote energy equals voltage times current. And then I assign the units of action per coulomb to the voltage term. And of course, the current term would be coulombs per second. So uh, imagine if I tried to do that. And then imagine if I said something like uh, the energy of this equation is the energy of a charge. Uh, yeah, so that is in essence what this equation is saying. This equation is saying that um, is being misinterpreted as the energy of a photon. Okay, it's being misinterpreted as the energy of a photon. It's a variable, okay? And this equation could easily be interpreted as the energy of a charge. And so um, we're allowed to do it here, but we're not really allowed to do it here. This is not how it's done. And so this is another little beef of mine. When you try to, when you look at unit analysis, uh, you start asking these questions and you start um, going, hmm, I don't know what's going on here. And so uh, you can apply different rules to different scales and expect to get the same interpretation. And so you have to apply the same laws to this to different scales to get the same interpretation or to get to a, a similar interpretation that we can understand at our scale. And so that is what I think is going on. Um, this is actually the, you know, true uh, power equation, power equals voltage times current, power has units joules per second, voltage has units joules per coulomb, and current has units coulomb per second. In a similar manner, in a similar manner, Let's see if I can find it here. In a similar manner, power equals Planck's constant times the frequency of light, and power has units joules per second. Planck's constant has units joule per cycle, per period, per wavelength, and frequency is, as usual, cycles per second. So next what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this momentum relationship and remember I said that in quantum mechanics uh, these equations seem to be written in terms of energy and momentum and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this momentum equation the same treatment that I gave the energy equation. And so the first thing I do there is I put a little delta symbol in front of the momentum term and what this reads, change in momentum. And remember in modified unit analysis, in modified unit analysis, I refer to, um, uh, to momentum as kinetic inertia. So this is another kinetic term. Okay, so, um, so what I do is I put a delta term in front of the kinetic inertia term or the momentum term and uh, write the equation like this. Next, I convert to the frequency domain. And the way you do that is you take the wavelength uh, and convert it, you convert it to frequency by uh, saying that wavelength is equal to the speed of light divided by frequency. 
And when you do that, you end up with the uh, momentum equation is equal to Planck's constant divided by the speed of light, which are two constants, times the frequency, times the frequency. And so um, just as a, as a note, this constant here, when you do this calculation, you get this value 2.2102, etc., times 10 to the minus 42. And this is the quantum of momentum that I report in my um, modified unit analysis specification. And so the quantum of momentum is equal to Planck's constant, which is a constant, divided by speed of light, which is a constant. This is a new constant of nature, which I'm associating with momentum, and I am calling it the quantum of momentum. So this is now looking very similar to the energy equation. Uh, change in energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency, and change in momentum is equal to what I'm calling the quantum of momentum times a frequency term. And so there, there's a very nice analogy between these two equations. And so what I want to do is I want to convert this uh, momentum equation to a force equation because, as I mentioned earlier, all of the important equations from um, from theoretical physics that work on the macro scale at the human scale uh, tend to be written in terms of force and power. Force and power are things that are measurable. And so um, in order to do that, what I do is I place the very the uh, hidden very previously hidden variable t into the equation. I actually write it in when there's a delta term here, there is a um, a, a time uh, interval parameter in the equation, and so I write it. And then what I do is I divide both sides by t, and you end up with change of momentum over some time interval is equal to the quantum of momentum times a frequency term. Okay, and of course, uh, momentum per unit time or change of momentum per unit time is a force has the units of force, and so now you can write uh, force is equal to Planck's constant divided by the speed of light, which is the quantum of momentum, times a frequency term. And so now we have the, um, that is found in my specification. This is this middle one here, uh, where I refer to um, momentum as kinetic inertia or motion inertia, and um, this is the equation um, I just derived, what I have just derived is the equation that I showed you in my specification. And these are the units, the units of momentum per cycle, quantum of momentum has units momentum per cycle, and the frequency term of course has units cycles per second. And finally we're going to talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is one of the cornerstones of quantum physics but it is often not deeply understood by those who have not carefully studied it. Or, or it is not properly understood by those who do carefully study this uh, with the incorrect assumptions. Okay, so it's my opinion that there are incorrect assumptions are being made because quantum mechanics is done in terms of momentum and energy. So the equations are written in terms of momentum and energy instead of in terms of force and power. And this is causing, I believe, a misinterpretation of all of quantum mechanics, including the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So in my Planck's constant in the nature of light paper, I apply a similar treatment to the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. relations and I end up with uh, a, very, um, a very simple and easy to read and very certain relation, okay? The interpretation of this relation is quite simple. The smallest change in energy that can possibly be detected and measured is the quantum of energy, okay? Which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules that is the uh, energy per cycle of um, electromagnetic radiation. So one, one way that this can be tested 
is to convert this energy uh, to a temperature and then see if we've detected any temperatures that are lower, smaller than the quantum of energy. And uh, so the way you do that is, is you convert from energy to temperature by dividing the energy by the Boltzmann constant. The Boltzmann constant has units joule per coulomb. So the Boltzmann constant is basically a conversion factor from the domain of energy to the domain of temperature. And so when you calculate the, when you plug in um, pl the quantum of energy into this equation, you end up with a temperature of 4.799243 times 10 to the minus 11 Kelvin. Now, if, if, uh, if I look into the, the experiments and find any experiment that has detected a value, uh, a temperature of that is lower than this, then this would falsify what I'm saying. But um, the coldest temperature ever created was by a group at MIT who created and measured a temperature of around uh, 500 pico Kelvin, which is five times 10 to the minus 10 Kelvin. So that is uh, one order of magnitude uh, um, warmer, one order of magnitude warmer than the uh, quantum of temperature, the, the smallest temperature that I, um, that I propose is possible to detect and measure. Anything lower than this is going to be absolute zero. Okay, so I'm not including absolute zero here, but um, this uh, temperature here is the uh, equivalent of the quantum of energy and this relation that I derive here, um, this relation that I derive here uh, basically says that um, there's no such thing as uh, we cannot detect, measure, uh, detect um, any signal, any energy of less than the quantum of energy. And that is why that is why all energies are quantized by the quantum of energy. That is why, you know, we even have a Planck's constant. This is the pixel. This is the pixel of energy. This is the pixel of energy. All energies are quantized by this value because it is the pixel of energy. It is the limit, the analogous to the limit of the digits of precision of a computer. It's analogous to that. And it is actually very similar to that because the limits to the digits of precision of a uh, of a double double structure in computer science is ten to the minus thirty four. Okay, ten to the minus thirty four. And so that is an interesting coincidence that the that Planck's constant is in the order of ten to the minus thirty four, which is um, which is you know, 34 digits of precision, basically, in computer science terms. So that's about it. I think I made all my points. Um, the, you know, the main question that I ask in this video is why at the human scale, at the macro scale, all of the important equations are written in terms of force and power, but in, in quantum mechanics, for some reason, the main equations that are written in terms of energy and momentum. Um, energy and momentum are not, um, not really measurable, actually. Force and power are measurable, and energy and momentum are, are interpreted. And so you can't actually measure energy, and you can't actually measure momentum, which is why I think they ended up with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, because I think they're realizing, I think they realize that, um, that you can't actually measure, you can't, I mean, th this relationship is true, um, this relationship is true because you can't know the momentum and you can't know the energy uh, until you make a measurement, until you run an experiment, a real experiment um, where we ultimately want to know, um, we want to know what's the force and what's the power. Okay, we really want to know what force do I need to, to get the job done? How much power do I need delivered to my house to get the job done? And so that, um, 
So my approach to quantum mechanics, where I uh, am converting the quantum mechanics equations um, from energy and momentum to, um, to, let's see, from energy and momentum to power and force. Okay, so I've got a force equation, I've got power equation in, in my quantum mechanics, okay, in what I'm calling modified unit analysis, but really this is my quantum mechanics. This is how I do it. I convert everything to the frequency domain. I have quantum constants for each, um, you know, for power and force and mass, which I call potential inertia. And so this is actually much simpler and it's easier to understand. Uh, at least it is for me. So, um, so anyone out there, so you guys, okay, because this I'm addressing you guys now. Okay, um, there you are. Okay, you guys out there um, who I've been battling, who I've been battling this for years and years and years, you're going to have to tell me what's wrong with my logic. Okay, so here's the other thing. Okay, so, so men don't like to be wrong. Here's another difference between men and women. Men don't like to be wrong. Women don't like to be wrong either, but we're willing to accept when we're wrong, I think, a little easier than, uh, than men. Okay, they don't want to be wrong. They don't want to admit that they're wrong. And the other problem is, like, if, if they're wrong, if they're right, it means that I'm wrong. That, that's how men think. So they think that if I'm right, it means that they are wrong. And, and that's not how I think at all. I think both approaches have... A certain amount of validity. They both um, explain things in a different way. I'm not even saying that one is right and one is wrong and one is good and one is bad. I'm just saying that my approach is different and worthy of further investigation. My approach leads to a different concept of light which does not, which, uh, does not involve an action constant or a photon. And so I think that, you know, this is a, a very important point. It's an, a point of interpretation. It's a point of the language. And um, so, you know, my language is different. My approach is different and, and that's all it is. So, uh, you know, it's my opinion that you can't say that I'm wrong unless you find something that I did wrong in my math and which in which case, um, I will admit that I made a mistake. If you can find a mistake in my math, in my logic, in my algebra, then of course I would admit that I'm wrong. But um, unless you can do that, I'm not going to admit that my approach, that there's something wrong with my approach. And so that's it. I'm going to leave it at that. And this video is already going to be fairly long. So hopefully, um, hopefully you see where I'm coming from and that you will uh, that you, you'll give what I said um, a little bit of thought, you know, give it some thought. Just think about it. And uh, ciao for now.